in the mid 80s right around when you graduated and you started working and um, you described the spin-offs uh, spin-off companies um, Describe the government. Was it still a military government or? No, it was a transition. 1985 was a transition. We had a huge inflation rate that time. That was really hard for us. So my first year as an engineer was my day by day life was not easy with my own finances because can imagine living in a in an economy where the inflation rate is 40% per month, yes, that was 40% per month. And actually there was one month, in February of 1987, if I'm not wrong, that the inflation rate was 70% in one month. So 1986, 1987, even 1988, those three years we had a hyperinflation in Brazil. It was really hard for Brazil to control the external debt to actually keep up with the own economy for us you know as citizens it was hard because we had to keep our money in, in not savings accounts but special accounts so people actually were living a very stressful life even though we have this nice opportunity for technologies or job offers we had that hyperinflation that was really taking our peace of mind away so the the military government could not stay longer and there was a huge pressure from the society to remove the military government and have a president elect elect by free elections directly elect by the people so in one hand uh, we had this nice opportunities for technology development. On the other hand, we had a hyperinflation. The uh, institutions, the federal institutions, the state institutions were collapsing because the politicians could not keep up with their, their policies. We had a pressure from, uh, from the society to have free elections. And this changed a lot because eventually the laws that were protecting the computer market, for example, they were uh, eliminated in 1988. And then we had our first president elected by free elections in, let's see, I have to remember now, Tancredo Neves was a transition president. I don't remember if it was 86 or 87. I have to go back to my history and my and take a look. But eventually, the, this president who was a transition president, he died in two or three months. He had a disease and he never took office. And his vice president was still from the... He was a civil, he was not a military, but he was very connected to the military. So for several years, 1986, 1987, 1988, we had this transition in the government from the military to the civil. We had a hyperinflation and we had companies collapsing because can you imagine having banking uh, loans with that huge hyperinflation? So it was really hard for the companies to invest in their future. It was really hard for anybody for the companies it was even harder for them to, to to invest in the near future so that was a kind of political situation that we had by that time so help me understand what what did that do to you as an engineer uh, to the kind of um, things that you were able and not able to do as an engineer you had you mentioned hyperinflation huge foreign debt transitional government uh, so I, I can imagine a significant socioeconomic instability. What did that do to, to you and to your friends, the other engineers, in, in, in terms of the kind of things that you were able to do? Well, my generation, maybe today the picture is different, but my generation, a lot of my friends today, they are managers in companies or in banks. I, I don't think that most of them are really in the technical field anymore. 
Some of my friends now, they became politicians. I have one, for example, who is just trying to be a vice mayor in the city of Sao Paulo now this year. So uh, a lot of people from my generation by that time are trying to find a way to work with that political instability. What I decided for myself that time, I don't know if it was the best decision, but that's what brought me here. What I decided for myself is to go into the academic career. That was my decision. We had other people who did other things, but I, I thought, well, I have to be good in something, okay? I can no longer work in a foundation that depends on projects supported by the government because the government is collapsing. I cannot afford to have my own company because it's hard for me to keep up with this company, with this... Uh, hyperinflation. So for me it was better to invest my future in something that I knew I could use for other things. So I decided to concentrate in my master's degree and I applied for an academic job in the University of Sao Paulo. There was a new department called Mechatronics. It was not a department yet, but it was a new course a mechatronics is a combination of mechanical engineer with electronics, mechatronics, and they were hiring new uh, faculty. At that time I could apply even though I was not yet a PhD, I was just finishing my master's degree, so I decided to invest my future in the academic career. And I know that several of my other friends, they decided to invest their future in something, you know, maybe some decide to go in, into administration, other to the political life, Maybe some have today a store or they invest in a business. I don't know. I still need to check what they are doing today. Do you remember if at that time of transition was there a significant decline of engineering enrollments as the younger generations began to see what was happening to the to your generation and how these companies were collapsing and no, yeah, you are you are certainly true because what I measure, <clears throat> if you remember, I told you there was <clears throat> there was an entrance examination from my university, and that entrance examination was really competitive. It was always competitive, but I remember there was a time that taking the entrance examination for the engineering degree in the University of São Paulo was really really the top choice. When, when I was just starting my academic career in 1988-89, uh, engineering was not the first choice anymore. It was law school, medical school, and let's see, what else? Uh, business. Yeah, maybe engineer came from first place to the fourth place. So it was still competitive. However, I was not was no longer the first choice in the entrance examination. So I, we could easily see by by that uh, uh, how to say by that measurement of uh, how many students were applying for engineering school in my university. On the other hand, we had some private schools that decided to take the educational role. So instead of uh, having a, a, a engineering degree for preparing engineers to work in research, they are preparing to work more in the workforce. So that was the compensation of one to the other. Okay. What else did this transition and this economic situation meant for engineering? For example, do you remember um, what kind of environment do you experience as now a graduate student in engineering? Um, in terms of the, the things that you were able to do, the kind of areas that you could research, the kind of resources that were available to you or not available to you? Well, see, my case was a unique situation because I was a graduate student finishing my master's degree, but I was also a lecturer of the university. Okay, so I was teaching at this mechatronics course, which was inside the mechanical engineer department. Today it's a mechatronics department. That time was 
a new course inside this department of mechanical engineering. So I was a lecturer teaching classes, but I was also doing my master's degree. And I start to learn a few things that time. That was 1989. I start my job as a lecturer in the University of Sao Paulo in 1989. I found that there were several opportunities to write proposals, to get grants, to have resources for uh, training people, to support the graduate program, to go abroad for PhD or master's degree, depends, depending on the area. So I start to be involved in this new, how to say, this new experience of being, not a professor at that time, but a lecturer, but being involved as someone who tries to develop uh, the educational side, the research side. So I remember in my master's degree, I wrote a proposal to a, to a, a research agency to support my, my research. I could not sign. You know, I wrote the proposal, but I could not sign because I was not a PhD yet. So I asked another person who was a PhD to sign my project. So I had this professor who was a doctor, who was a PhD, signing a proposal that I wrote to support my, my, uh, my research. So I had this feeling that you have to fight for whatever you believe. And I believed that time that I had to write a research project to support my own research. You know, instead of my professor writing, I was doing that. So that always happened in my life. I had to write my papers, I had to write my proposals. So this is still true until today. But I learned that very, very early in my academic career. And that time, even though it was a transition time, we had a lot of opportunities from the federal government, from the state government, to support research, to support education, to support projects. So it still, it still was a little bit on the same, how to say, momentum that we had before in that instability with companies, we also had that route of doing research at university. So could you say that then the, the research environment um, was able to sustain fairly well the political and economic instability? Yes, for a few years. Mm -hmm. Of course now it's different, but between 1985 and 1995, 96, yeah, it sustained. It sustained because we still had a lot of investments from the government. Okay. Let's um, 